Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patrons, Do C. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. Just a quick fun fact. We know that years later, Tesla still has roughly 60% of the auto EV market in big regions like the United States, but it also owns 60% of the fast charging in the US. According to the Department of Energy, almost 21,000 of the about 33,000 public fast chargers are currently Tesla superchargers or 63%. With the recent chatter around a possible Tesla factory in Turkey, I dug this up. Turkey has become one of the most important manufacturers and suppliers of European automobile manufacturers in recent years. In 2020, Ford produced 455,000 vehicles, Renault 378,000, and Mercedes 19.4 thousand all in Turkey. Turkey has become one of the world's leading production centers with nearly 500,000 employees, more than a thousand companies, and 31 specialized industrial zones in the automotive sector. At the same time, with its location and potential, it's an important and supportive country for the EU countries like France and Germany. And they noted having qualified human resources, high production, and export experience. So perhaps these Tesla Turkey talks have a bit more legs than some people may be expecting. I touched on it very briefly a few days ago, but since the video has been out a few days, here is John from CleanerWatt. According to one of my sources, Tesla's Cato Road 4680 battery factory will be temporarily shutting down for three months beginning in November. Just a source, so take it how you will, but it would line up with certain things that we've seen, no standard range all-wheel drive Model Y, the new Cybercell going into production ahead of Cybertruck production, if they did want to switch over production lines at Cato Road to move to this next Gen 2 version of the 4680. I will say though, if Tesla were to shut down Cato Road for November, December, and January completely, that has to mean that they're confident with their 4680 production at Texas to get the Cybertruck production up and running. And the good news, if we've learned anything from Tesla over the past few years it's when they have shutdowns it's so that they can come back even stronger going forward we have a key tesla supplier investing 99 billion dollars to build its first plant outside of asia in new mexico they'll begin construction on the factory in santa Teresa near the u.s border with mexico early next year mass production set for 2025. Part of the reason they noted the proximity to North American customers, which account for 60% of Hoda's sales. In addition to Tesla, Hoda also supplies GM and Ford. In what could arguably be the best credit redemption option for Tesla, we now have a Model 3 Performance sweepstakes. So you can enter for your chance to win a free Model 3 Performance. One winner will be selected at random to receive a Model 3P on October 6th this year. Multiple entries allowed. Nice. More on credit redemptions when it comes to the Cybertruck sweepstakes. It's now 1,000 credits up from 500 before. If you've been around the channel for a bit, you'll know we've oftentimes mentioned big banks are going to want a piece of Tesla's deals and they could start offering better rates in partnership with Tesla. That's exactly what we get with this one. Australia's biggest bank is partnering with the country's most popular EV maker, Tesla, to speed up adoption. The Commonwealth Bank announced this deal with Tesla today, revealing personal and business loans for EVs. From Tesla, they'll be offered at a discounted rate on the Tesla website. Website. The bank's lending GM said we're seeing really strong demand from customers. Almost one in six of our new car loans are now electric. Overwhelmingly, customers are choosing Tesla, which is why it makes a lot of sense for us to partner. The deal will see Tesla buyers able to apply for a ComBank personal loan as they order a vehicle online. The bank will offer loans at a fixed rate of 5.49%, a discount of up to 1% on the price of a standard vehicle loan. The bank's finance GM said he also expected many loan applications to come from businesses as 40% of companies are expected to deploy EVs and hybrids in their fleets over the next year. All customers I'm talking to on the business side are interested in what's happening with EVs, how they can think about the transition, how they can adapt their buildings to charge. Provided the flow of stock continues to come into the country, I think we'll continue to see substantial increases on the business side. Through August this year, there have been around 56,000 EVs sold in Australia year to date and Tesla makes up 32,000 of that. 
again, right around 60%. But it's not just the Commonwealth Bank. They're one of several financial institutions to offer discounts on EV and hybrid vehicle loans. So in a world where everybody is dealing with higher interest rates and the cost of goods, to have even a little bit of an incentive to go buy an electric vehicle, specifically a Tesla, is of course a great thing. It looks like Ford has avoided a strike with the Canadian Union Unifor at the last hour. But in doing so, I think they've shown their hand to the UAW. Unifor and Ford have reached a tentative deal, but the details are not immediately available. Unifor said, we leveraged our union's most powerful weapon, the right to strike. When faced with the prospect of an all out strike, the company made a significant offer to the union. The bargaining committee has unanimously recommended the deal to the union's rank and file membership for a ratification vote. Had these strikes gone through though, there would have been a lack of engines that would have halted production of two of Ford's top models at US factories, the best-selling F-Series and the Mustang. A strike in Canada would have been more consequential for Ford sales than the strike at the one in the US factories right now. But I think the UAW's plan all along has been to save striking where it's going to hurt the F-150 and the Mustang for a later date. From Renew Economy, rooftop and distributed solar has set a remarkable new record for the share of generation in the world's biggest standalone grid after peaking at nearly two gigawatts, this in South Australia. This happened on Sunday when it accounted for a record 74% of generation in the grid. And they said that mark is remarkable because only a few years ago, most energy experts would have said this was not possible on a standalone grid of this size or any grid for that matter. And it looks like Western Australia's main grid is set to get more batteries. Just Tuesday, they announced CATL has been awarded contracts worth more than $1 billion. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but I hope you choose to set huge goals and live life with some vigor. I see so many friends and family going through life on autopilot with no real plans or purpose. This happens to all of us at times, but many people get stuck here and live here. Life is far more exciting when we have aspirations we're pursuing and things that get us excited to get out of bed. Now don't fret if you're on autopilot right now, but don't stay there either. AG1 is the sponsor of this video and it's become a part of my life, helping me to stay energized to live life well. Small choices compounded daily make all the difference over a lifetime. The studies show many of us are nutrient deficient and we can't reach our potential in that place. And yes, whole natural foods first, but for those times life gets off track or to have an option to alleviate coffee addictions and afternoon crashes, AG1 is a killer option in my opinion. Huberman doesn't play games and with him on the advisory board, it's an extra feather in their cap. Other than the cost, which I know many of us spend on useless stuff every month anyway, what do you have to lose? You can head to drinkag1.com slash electrified linked below to get five travel packs and a one-year supply of vitamin D3 K2 for free. Invest in yourself it's worth it. On Monday, Tesla requested a property on Wonderland Road South to be rezoned to allow for an automotive sales and service establishment, this in London, Ontario, so you might be getting a sales, service, and delivery center soon. With this one, it would be new construction on a currently vacant lot. So if this goes through, it could be another purpose-built showroom and sales center like we just saw in Victoria, British Columbia. This post from Tesla Chan was going around where Grace Tao Lin was speaking in Chinese briefly and they talked about Tesla doing more over the next decade in the free trade zone. China actually formally expanded the Shanghai Free Trade Zone or FTZ you might see it to encompass where Giga Shanghai was initially built so that that area would benefit from a raft of tax incentives and duty waivers as the newest section of the FTZ. Duties will be deferred on certain shipments passing through the Lingyang section of the FTZ, and there are also tax exemptions for international goods passing through customs areas in that region. When the Chinese government made that move in a way for Tesla, they were essentially doubling the size of the FTZ, and they were hoping to draw new investment and sharpen its edge in advanced manufacturing. From the driven, Australian firm EV FireSafe tracks passenger EV battery fires worldwide. From 2010 to June this year, its database records only 393 verified fires globally out of some 30 million EVs on the road. 
There was also another report May of this year by the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency that found vehicles powered by ICE engines were 20 times more likely to catch fire than EVs in Sweden. And yes, I know that saying ICE engines is redundant, but I'm leaving it there anyway. Personally, I like to have as many of these studies bookmarked as I can, so if you wanted to follow suit, it'll be linked below. Kathy Wood has said Tesla is the biggest AI opportunity in the world today. This is a CNBC Pro article though, and out of principle, there's no way I can pay for this. But doing some digging, I was able to find this. Kathy Wood predicted that the robot taxi industry could generate eight to $10 trillion in revenue by 2030. I wanted to share that little anecdote though as a segue to this. In Elon's biography, there was this part that was making its rounds on the internet. Elon was explaining why he thought Tesla was on a trajectory to be the most valuable company in the world, one that made $1 trillion in profits every year. But there's actually something else in this passage that should not be overlooked. Elon said, I guess I've always wanted to push my chips back on the table or play the next level of the game. I'm not good at sitting back. Elon was told, you don't have to be in a state of war at all times, but his response, it's part of my default settings. This beautifully encapsulates why Tesla is where they're at today and why they're going to do more incredible things going forward. Most normal human CEOs strive to get some level of success and when they achieve it, they tend to take their foot off the accelerator and make incremental improvements. Look at Apple right now. The risk taking goes down, the innovation decelerates and all of that, but, but that's just not how Elon is wired. So he's constantly going to be looking for these huge world changing things to build teams, to spin up around, to eventually work on and solve. Tesla has that warlike mentality still as one of the biggest companies in the world because of how Elon is wired and because of how he's built the company over the past decade plus. And there are certainly pros and cons with that approach, but over the long term as a shareholder, that's exactly what I personally want to sign up for. Larry Ellison, who served on Tesla's board for a few years and is close personal friends and an advisor of sorts to Elon, just gave a keynote at Cloud World 2023 and listen to this. That's real. Uh, uh, that's an, uh, or that was the first Oracle police car. Uh, and we had to put in if you will, a Tesla-like screen in the Tesla position uh, where the application, uh, the navigation application, uh, checking drivers, you know, uh, ch checking uh, license plates, things, things like, like that. All, all, all is done, all voice, all voice activated. Every, everything is voice activated. If there's an incident the officer is driving to, they will see what the officer who's already on site sees from their camera. You know, they'll see what's on the audio video network. Uh, our next generation police car is coming out very soon. It's, it's my favorite police car. It's my favorite car, actually. It's Elon's favorite car. <laughs> uh, it's incredible. Uh, I know too much about it. Some of it's, some of it's still uh, to be disclosed. But it, among other things, it's um, very safe, very fast. Um, it's got a stainless steel, a stainless steel body. And we don't have to add a screen to it because, or we don't have to add cameras to it because we, we actually use their existing cameras and their existing screen to put our application, uh, our, our application, our uh, uh, up for uh, people in the uh, in the Tesla vehicles. You can use a non-Tesla vehicle, and we can enhance it, or you can use a you can use a Tesla vehicle. This all this stuff is up and running. It's actually deployed in Stanislaus County. I know for the police, and I believe also for the fire, which uh, you know one one uh, command center. Uh, it's it's uh, Stanislaus County is uh, a rural area uh, in California near Yosemite Valley. So definitely a pretty exciting revelation, Ellison and Elon teaming up again. I think some people are confused thinking this is an Oracle police truck. It's really just Oracle outfitting or tricking out a Cybertruck and other vehicles with their software and cloud features and some extra first responder type benefits that will make their lives easier and safer. We have a Congress member asking Tesla today to detail its relationship with CATL amid concerns that US EV subsidies were 
were improperly flowing to foreign entities. In the letter, he asked if Tesla has contracts with CATL or is considering contracts. He said the committee is concerned CATL may be trying to negotiate other agreements like the agreement with Ford that is still under investigation for that big LFP battery factory in Michigan. He also asked Elon if Tesla had taken any actions to increase production on the number of vehicles that'll qualify for the clean vehicle credit. Seems like a question he should know the answer to, but he also wrote to Nissan asking for details about their battery suppliers and their US manufacturing plans. But look, in fairness, one of the main drivers of the IRA in the first place was to reduce our dependence on China, so I understand why they wanna learn more. I've had a few people messaging me about Tesla insurance and why we've had this delay. I don't have any insider information, but here's what we do know. Right now, it's still only active in 12 states. Most recently, it was Minnesota. We heard about that in November of last year. We do know that Zach Kirkhorn, who is now no longer at Tesla, was part of overseeing this program, but he left shortly after we already had a gap in new rollouts. I was able to find this. Tesla's MGA Relationships Managing General Agent produced total direct premiums written of 242.9 million last year, up from 111.7 million in 2021. The next two states where Tesla insurance is supposed to launch are Florida and Washington. Each state regulator has approved Tesla's offering. The Florida filing was approved in March of this year. The last update we got, Zach said Tesla was currently at a $300 million annual premium run rate as of the end of 2022. He said Tesla insurance is growing 20% per quarter, so it's actually growing faster than the vehicle business. And in states where Tesla insurance is on average, 17% of the customers in those states are using a Tesla insurance product. But the main thing I wanted to remind everybody of is even though we're not hearing new states approved for Tesla insurance, in the background in these current states, Tesla insurance is still helping Tesla drive down the repairability costs. Elon said a big part of Tesla insurance was to have this feedback loop into minimizing the cost of repair for Teslas worldwide. Before, they did not have a good insight into that because other insurance companies would cover the cost and it was usually unreasonably high. So having this program in place in this tight feedback loop, Tesla has adjusted the design of the cars and made changes in software of the cars to minimize the cost of repairs. And one other thing I wanted to mention on this, when it comes to the Tesla investor questions through say for the Q3 call, we should maybe be asking about Tesla insurance to get an update. So just something to keep in mind if you want to ask a question. Rob touched on the factory shutdown at Giga Texas that's been going on now for seemingly two weeks last night, but I wanted to do my part in also spreading the word. Here at Giga Texas, there's a couple of items that I wanna talk about before we get into the video. Now, because it's September 11th, it's somewhat quieter today, plus the fact that production has uh, basically stopped for the last couple of weeks or for the most part of September. And on that note, most recently, Troy Teslike has his estimate publicly at 442,000. I'm not gonna share his exact updated number from Patreon, but I will say it's, we should get the official company compiled consensus in the next 10 days or so, and most likely it'll be much lower than this 462,000 analyst consensus now. And as a refresher, here are Tesla's Q2 numbers from this year, 466.1 thousand deliveries. So it's looking like we're going to come in below that for quarter three, but again, should have been expected Tesla broadcast this on the call. Early today, the UAW has struck a ZF Group plant in Alabama where they build front and rear axles for Mercedes vehicles built nearby. The core issues for workers there, wages, that tiered wage structure, and healthcare coverage. For now though, they're saying this plant will continue to run. Magna's new head of Europe had some fairly interesting comments on Tesla's gigacasting strategy. He said, I think we've got to be careful. It's not as easy as it seems. Magna is the world's fourth largest automotive parts supplier. When asked if Magna would move into megacastings, he said, we're going into it a little bit. 
Obviously, we all know there's one automaker very active in this, Tesla. I know a lot of people are reviewing Tesla products. And he added, not as easy as it seems because of quality reasons. It's also very capital intensive. Casting is a really big business for us, especially aluminum casting and it's growing. We're looking into mega casting, but we're not actively pursuing it. He was asked if customers are asking for it. Everybody is learning right now what's out there. Our customers are ripping these cars apart and really taking a look at them. But he said, we will not jump blindly into this. And the key concerns from customers in Europe, ADAS is a huge subject in Europe. I think time to market is also an important topic. My worry is also the Chinese entering the European market. Not as easy as it looks, huh? You don't say. Something to keep an eye on from the Texas utility, they just put out a RFP or a request for proposals for 500 megawatts of energy storage. This from CPS Energy, which serves San Antonio, Texas. Responses are welcomed for both large scale and smaller projects. The deadline for proposals is October 18th of this year. And if you assume an average three hour duration, which as far as I've seen is the national average in the state, this would be a roughly 1.5 gigawatt hour project or 1,500 megawatt hours. The United States and Japan are calling for more collaboration to meet EV requirements. A global benchmark event just kicked off with a call from the US and the Japanese government representatives who stressed the need to strengthen international cooperation given the scale and speed of investments required for the energy transition. This following back in March when the US and Japan signed an agreement focusing on free trade in critical minerals. The US currently has free trade agreements with 20 nations and is looking to add more, including a recent discussion with Indonesia. The Minister of Economy from Japan said, given that the battery supply chain is huge and unfortunately Japan is a resource poor country, we recognize the importance of strengthening global cooperation to secure battery metals, upstream resources, and to make sure the supply chain is more resilient. Simon Moores from Benchmark said, sodium ion gigafactory capacity ramp up is underway in China at 10.5 four gigawatt hours 2024 will see a step increase in sodium ion capacity in china as it soars toward the 100 gigawatt hour mark sodium ion should now be considered near-term next-gen battery technology one thing that'll be very interesting to watch is how gm and chevy handle the new redesigned chevy bolt which presumably will use the altium platform it's already pretty close with the base version of the chevy equinox and it's tbd if they're going to keep it at that $30,000 starting price. But if the Bolt does become a bit more expensive on this Altium platform, it's going to become very close to the Equinox entry price point. The chair of Ford UK said Britain risked undermining the country's transition to EVs if the government relaxes its current target to ban new petrol and diesel car sales by 2030. The British Prime Minister this week is expected to push back to 2035 the non-electric car ban from 2030. Ford's UK chair said the 2030 target is a vital catalyst to accelerate forward into a cleaner future. It'd be great if they were just pushing for it and believed in it without these looming bans. And he said, we need the policy to bolster the EV market in the short term and supporting consumers while headwinds are strong, infrastructure remains immature, tariffs loom, and cost of living is high. Citing serious safety concerns, Nancy Pelosi and Kevin Mullen are asking a federal regulator to collect more detailed data on the operations of Cruz and Waymo in San Francisco. In a letter dated yesterday, they cited incidents in which autonomous vehicles reportedly obstructed emergency responders, and the San Francisco Fire Department logged some 50 incidents this year in which autonomous vehicles interfered with emergency responders. And sadly, it looks like it's not just in San Francisco, but in Austin, Texas as well. The new Lexus boss has said an even bigger transformation is on the way in 2026 as the brand leaps into its next generation of EVs. Next month, Lexus will unwrap their first concept for those EVs at the Japan Mobility Show. Look at this thing, the Lexus LM Chauffeured People Mover.
On the radar is a software operating system that Lexus said will unlock a new world of personalized premium perks and performance, as well as luxury tailored to regional preferences. They're also considering an all electric stick shift technology. And there are rumors of an EV sports coupe positioned as a spiritual successor to the legendary LFA supercar. Back to today's world, Toyota and Lexus brands combined sold under 25,000 EVs worldwide in 2022. Through August of this year, Lexus sold only 2,068 RZ electric crossovers in the US. But he also said this, it's important to humbly look at and learn from Tesla's achievements. One of our first steps will be modifying and rethinking our production methods. Again, every time I stop and really think about what's going on across the entire automotive industry and throughout the supply chain, it really is all spearheaded by Tesla alone. It's still wild to me that this one little company 10 years ago that everybody expected to fail and many wanted to fail is now one of the most dominant companies on the planet. That's actually changing the world and that's not even hyperbole. It's pretty awesome. Lucid and Rivian are set to open showrooms in Pasadena by the end of this year. A company like Mobileye and a company like Aurora that we cover as well use a hybrid approach, meaning that sure, they have some, some machine learning in there and some artificial intelligence, but within that system, they also think that hard coding software instructions is the best way to go. And in a thoughtful blog post uh, late last week, Mobileye CEO came out and explained his logic behind having that software code embedded. Aurora believes that the same approach is going to win. And frankly, in our recent note, we said, we don't know who's going to win this race. But at the end of the day, it's a fascinating debate. Who is going to win? Pure artificial intelligence and neural networks? or a hybrid approach between the two. You all know where my chips are at. Don't forget, check out AG1 linked below. If you do, thank you in advance. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did. You can find me on X linked below. And a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.